I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's Gospel reading seems as if Jesus was on a roll when it comes to telling parables. For the past two Sundays, two parables were highlighted, but today we have five, or is it six? Although they're all brief ones. After all, I guess, having told about 50 parables, we need to get through them as fast as possible. Or maybe these parables share something in common. They may have similar meanings or interpretations. And so Jesus continues his description of the kingdom of heaven and what the kingdom of heaven is like. But you never seem to get a precise or clear-cut definition or understanding of what he means by the kingdom of heaven, as, Michael, as Matthew liked to call it, while other gospels refer to it as the kingdom of God. So we have to presume by all Jesus and the scriptures tell us about the kingdom of heaven that it is so stunning and all-encompassing that we cannot fully grasp its concept. In describing what the kingdom of heaven in these five or six brief parables, Jesus speaks of a kingdom that is not in a far-off place or in some exalted place up there. He seems to be portraying God's reign as something that is currently taking place, currently present here on earth by using images that are a part of this world. A mustard seed, yeast, treasure, a merchant in search of pearls, and a net. And these five concise images are arranged in pairs with the exception of the parable of the net, but they all give us an impression of what God's kingdom is like. In the first instance, the mustard seed and the yeast demonstrate a kingdom that begins very small and grows extremely large. When a mustard plant starts to grow, a mustard seed starts to grow, it spreads everywhere. And remember, the mustard is a weed and an aggressive one, just like the dandelions of which I spoke in last Sunday's sermon. You have hell getting rid of such weeds. And the mustard seed is tiny and unimpressive. But do not underestimate it. It can grow into a large plant and spread like crazy. And similarly, yeast is also small and insignificant. But when mixed with flour, although it's hidden, it will make the dough rise slowly but surely. And both the mustard seed and the yeast start from small beginnings, but they grow into something that cannot be controlled. They may be hidden at the beginning, but eventually they grow and become widespread and abundant. And so Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. It starts small, but it grows and becomes abundant. And widespread. And although the mustard seed and leavening have had some negative connotations in Jesus' day, in that the mustard seed or the mustard plant was a nuisance to many crops that were planted, while yeast was a lump of fermented dough that was left over from the last batch of bread, symbolizing corruption. Yet, there was a Jewish law in which it had to be eliminated from their homes in order to celebrate the Passover. And so Jesus refers to the way the mustard seed and the yeast as examples of the way the kingdom of heaven works. The next pair of parables focus on another aspect of the kingdom of heaven, this time the value of the kingdom. Jesus speaks about someone who found treasure which was hidden in another person's field. 
And after discovering the treasure, he doesn't tell the owner of the field. Instead, he goes and he sells all that he has in order to buy that particular field. And it begs us to ask two questions. Why was he digging in another person's backyard, in another person's field? And why didn't he just take the treasure and go and bury it in his own field? And Jesus doesn't tell us these details, which means that he was obviously not concerned with them. Nevertheless, we see an underlying level of deception on the part of the man who found the treasure. However, although this parable may seem puzzling as all parables are, it is possible that it was set against the background of finers keepers, losers weepers. And furthermore, Jesus is more focused on the joy that goes into finding something that is a treasure and recognizing that it's worth everything to become its owner. And then we see the same concept of the kingdom's value in the parable of the merchant who searches for fine pearls and found one of great value. It is like a child walking on a beach and looking for seashells and finds one that is so beautiful, he or she cannot help but to take it home. And on finding this rather valuable pearl, the merchant sold everything he has in order to purchase it. In other words, the merchant liquidates his assets in order to own this fine pearl. My friends, what Jesus is saying here is that once you truly understand the value of God's kingdom, you will go to extreme measures to obtain it, to be a part of it, to live within it. And hence, Jesus is saying to us that the kingdom of heaven is extremely valuable, and you need to realize that. We see the same thing happening in today's Old Testament reading with Jacob and Laban and the sisters Leah and Rachel. Jacob had agreed to work for his maternal uncle Laban for seven years so that he could marry Rachel, Laban's younger daughter. However, after working so faithfully and given a big wedding celebration, thinking that he would obtain Rachel's hand in marriage, he was deceived by his uncle, and given given Leah instead, because the younger daughter could not be married before the elder daughter. But Rachel was so precious and of such great value, and and Jacob loved her so much that he agrees to work for another seven years so as to have Rachel as his wife. He was committed to taking her as his wife, and so too, Jesus tells us, the kingdom of heaven is like that. It is such a precious treasure. It is so valuable that when you find it, since nothing compares to it, you do what it takes to maintain it. You, can, you become committed to being a part of it. And then we come to the parable of the net, which is similar to last Sunday's parable of the wheat and the weeds, or what I like to call the parable of the marigolds and the dandelions. And this parable is about judgment, and we, are, and we aren't comfortable talking about God's judgment in today's world. When a net is cast into the sea, it catches all kinds of fish, the good and the bad, and the fishermen pull in all the fish, and wait to sort them out later. They don't sort them out while they pull them in, and they wait till later, when they get back to, sh- to the shore. In our world, the good, the bad, and the indifferent exist together. And the good and the bad and the indifferent can exist within our own selves also. And we spend too much time trying to make judgments of others, And even Jesus does not overemphasize this point, for he knows that it is not for us to do, but it is for us to love and to forgive, to be patient and to wait, to pray and to help. 
For in the same way, fishermen are, wa are, are willing to pull in all sorts of fish and to sort them out later, we should let God take care of the sorting out in God's own time and God's own way. Because God is the one who knows our hearts and who knows our motives. He is the one who loves us the most and knows us the best. So Jesus is saying here that we need to leave the judgment to God because God knows each one of us and we do not know each one of us. In the end, Jesus asks us, asks us as he asks his disciples back then, have you understood all this? Are you sure you understand all I am sharing with you? Do you understand the whole notion of the kingdom of heaven beginning small and growing large? Do you understand the value of the kingdom of heaven? Do you understand that God is the one responsible for sorting out the good and the bad afterwards? Are you sure you understand? In other words, are you really listening and hearing and understanding what I am saying? Are you being open to letting the kingdom of heaven, which is already present and at work, change you and to turn your life around? Are you truly willing to let go of being in charge of your life and to let God transform you? And the disciples in Jesus' day said, yes. They said, yes. And the question is, are you willing to say yes? And if you can say yes like the disciples, then Jesus has one more parable for you at the end of the gospel reading today. Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. In other words, being trained as a scribe for the kingdom of heaven involves dedicating our lives to learning the truth of the gospel and sharing it with others. For that is what scribes did. They wrote so that others will learn from them. Jesus invites and encourages us to accept him as the new treasure, the, old, the new covenant, which fulfills or fulfilled the promise of the old treasure, the old covenant. My friends, life is not always what it seems to be. In the same way, the kingdom of heaven and following Jesus may not always be what it seems or what you thought you signed up for. Trust me, I know. And sometimes you're given tasks to do for the kingdom, but it could be hard going at times. What you are doing may not grow as quickly as you would like, but with patience and faith, it will bear the fruit that God expects it to bear. Other times you may see the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and following Jesus as a hidden treasure ready to be discovered and to be valued. And when you find it, you want to be a part of it because you find it to be valuable. However, Oftentimes, we are not prepared to be committed to what is valuable. For example, in order to value our relationships, we need to be committed. In order to value our work, we need to be committed. In order to value our church, we need to be committed. In order to value our relationship with God and his kingdom, we need to be committed. Our focus needs to be on God and his kingdom, allowing him to transform us with his love and to make us his so that we may share 
the value and treasure of him with others. Amen.